All right, so story time with Wes. Uh, the year was 2016, and I had just left my job at Huddle, where I was uh, working on a mobile app and designing for the partnership that we had with Nike uh, at the time. And this was a really fun project, my first time working in mobile. And at the time, I was just really leaning into the craft. So these craft skills that we know of as product thinking, interaction design, visual design. And I was just starting my job at Dropbox. And I was super, super excited to start at Dropbox. Uh, I actually have some footage of my first day. Uh, you could see I used to have hair, had a mustache back then. And so, like I said, I was really leaning into uh, these craft skills, and I was looking forward to that. Uh, but over the course of my first few months, I actually found myself working in a lot of different domains. So things like selling ideas, uh, systems design. You know, Dropbox is a very complex system. When you get underneath the hood, how do you make sense of it? You know, aligning teams uh, around common missions, you know, writing documentation for engineers and uh, design specs, you know, goal setting for uh, strategic roadmaps, and even decision making as a group. How do you do that as a single person, but then how do you do it as a group? And if I'm being really honest with all of you today, uh, I begin to feel myself stretch a little bit. And I actually brought some footage of that moment as well. <laughs> So, quick show of hands, has anyone else ever felt like this in your, in your role, where you're working a little bit outside of your comfort zone? Good. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. And this all reminds me of something that uh, I've always known, which is that there's a lot more to being a product designer than just designing products. And now, this is a realization that I had. It's a realization that it sounds like all of you have had. And as we look out into our industry, it's something that uh, it seems like all of us are, are having. So we'll read articles around uh, decision making. We'll read articles around problem solving and stakeholders. And I think deep down inside, we all know that we're supposed to be multidisciplinary designers. And that's, that's how we should be, and we should be able to work in a lot of different domains. But the question still remains, how do we actually become better decision makers, better problem solvers, and even better influencers? And the answer to that is to develop mental models. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So just to give you a quick preview of the talk, first we'll go over what is a mental model. We'll start with a really good baseline definition. Next we'll get into why it's important. If you're going to take the time to develop mental models, you want to you know, make sure the juice is worth the squeeze, as they say. And then finally, we'll get into the how. How do you actually develop mental models? How do you use them? And even more specifically, I'll go over seven different mental models that I personally use on a, on a daily basis. So let's just go ahead and just jump right in. What are mental models? You know, very simply put, a mental model is a simple explanation of how something in the world works. A simple explanation of how something in the world works. And the cool thing is, is that you already have several of them. So for instance, supply and demand. You know, this is a model that helps us understand how the economy works. You know, there's leverage. That's a model that helps you understand how force is applied and how you can amplify it. And then finally, Pareto's principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. This is a model that helps you understand the relationship between cause and effect. So why would we actually use mental models? Uh, there's a few reasons for this. One, they help you simplify complexity. You know, as product designers, we are working in complex fields. And the more senior you become in your role, the more you're going to have to deal with Ambiguity, just more and more ambiguity in your, in your role and in uh, the problems that you're going to be solving for. And it helps to have reference points in your head to deal with that ambiguity. And those reference points are mental models. Next, they help you improve your problem solving. So as product designers, we all identify as problem solvers. And it really helps to develop mental models that are very specific towards solving 
uh, a variety of different problems. Next, they help you communicate your ideas more effectively. So at some point, we're all going to have to talk about our work, right? And so it helps to have a few different models that help you structure that content. And then finally, they'll help you make better decisions. Uh, we make design decisions all day, every day. And so how do you actually develop a few models that are very specific to uh, deciding between different options? So how do you actually use them? This all sounds really lofty and everything, but how do you actually like, get into it? So the first thing that you'll need to understand here is that you'll need several different models. So this all actually reminds me of a, a, of a quote from the, the billionaire investor Charlie Munger. And he says, the first rule is that you've got to have multiple models. Because if you just have one or two that you're using, you'll torture reality so that it fits your models, or at least you'll think it does. And it's like that old saying that goes, you know, if, the, if you only have a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. So how do I do this? I actually do this by uh, creating a cheat sheet of a bunch of useful models. And I've actually printed it out, and I put it on my desk for easy access. And this actually helps keep these models kind of top of mind for me. And if we zoom in, uh, we could just see a little bit how this works. So uh, first, if I'm in like a problem-solving scenario, uh, I'll have like a list of trigger questions for myself. And these questions then uh, help prompt me to use a very specific model. And so what I've done is I've collected seven of my favorite models from that list. And these are uh, what I would consider the starter pack for product designers. And we're actually going to go over these today. These are some of the most useful models that I've come across and that helped me as a product designer. And they're grouped into a few categories. So the first three models have to deal with problem solving. Uh, the next two models have to deal with decision making. And then lastly, the last two models have to deal with communication. So let's go ahead and just jump right in and go to problem solving models. So if I'm problem solving and I find myself asking, you know, do I need an original solution to a complex problem? Then something that I'll try there is called first principles. And the way this works is First, we start with a, a nice big problem. And typically, you know, if you come across a big, hairy problem, you want to start breaking it down into its component parts, and kind of solving those individually, and then bringing it back up into a nice, cohesive solution. And I recently did this on a project where I was working on a file recovery feature at Dropbox. And I was talking through it at the beginning of the project with my manager, and he was saying, like, actually, you should try and break this down quite a bit. And so in that conversation, I pulled out a piece of paper and pen and just like sketched out what we were talking about. And this gave me like a really good framework for thinking of how I was going to approach this problem. And instead of leaving it here in the abstract, I actually brought it into some mind mapping software and started on the left-hand side, you see the original problem statement that our team started with. And then from there, I broke that down into smaller problems and then smaller even questions, and then begin to answer those questions and then build it back up into a cohesive solution. And what this did was it gave me and the rest of our team like a really good 360 degree view of the problem and then also what a solution was going to start to look like. And this was even before we started ideating. Now this is a lot of detail, so I did a smaller version of this uh, and then this is what I actually put into a lot of the design specs and the product docs that we were creating for the project. So that's first principles. Next, if I'm asking myself, am I only thinking of ideal solutions? Something I'll try there is called inversion. And the way this works is typically at the beginning of a, a design problem, uh, we start to immediately try and think of ideal solutions. And this is actually how uh, you should start. But you know, if you're having a, kind of like a roadblock or you want to make sure that you're solving for a lot of different, you know, edge cases, uh, it's actually good to start to ideate actually just bad solutions and then ask yourselves, how might we avoid these? And it's just a, a different way of approaching problem solving. 
I recently did this on a project where uh, at the beginning of the project, me and my PM, we went out to our support agents, and we actually uh, just did a big brainstorm with them about all of the worst case scenarios and all of the bad solutions that uh, the team could possibly come up with. And this really gave us a, a good framework for uh, solving for a lot of different edge cases up front, and also making sure that uh, we weren't designing something that was going to like, you know, go off the rails. And then lastly, if I'm asking myself, am I solving the right problem? Something that I'll try here is called abstraction laddering. And the way this works is typically you'll have an initial problem that you start with. And if you want to get more concrete, you could do that by asking yourself how questions. And then if you wanted to get a little bit more abstract and above the problem, you could do that by asking yourself why questions. So just to give an example of this, if uh, the design prompt was to design a better can opener, you might do that by you know, creating a, a can opener that has some paint on it, maybe put a bow on it. But you could ask yourself why you might do that. And maybe the new statement becomes to just get soup out of a can. And what's cool about this is that you could actually traverse back down the ladder by asking a how question from a little bit higher up. So if you want to get soup out of a can, how would you do that? You know, maybe you could just redesign the top of the can itself to a pop top. And so now you're no longer designing a can opener, you're designing the top of the can. And I find this is just a really good way to make sure that you're, you're working at the right level. So those are three different models that help you understand how to solve problems. Next, we'll look at some decision-making models. When I'm faced with a decision, one of the first questions I ask myself is, what kind of decision is this? And something that's useful here is something called a hard choice model. So you can look at pretty much any decision across two different spectrums. Like one is how impactful the decision is, and then secondly, how comparable the options are, how easy it is to compare. So for low impact decisions, if they're easy to compare, that's just like a no-brainer, right? Just kind of go with what feels good. But if they're hard to compare, then that's really like an apples and oranges type of decision. And then for high impact decisions, if the options are easy to compare, that's like a big choice. You know which way you should be going, but you just know that it's going to be a very impactful choice. And then if they're hard to compare, then that's truly a hard choice. And what I find actually is that uh, a lot of times I think I'm making a hard choice uh, when in fact I'm actually just making a, a big choice or an apples and oranges decision. And this framework helps me differentiate between them. So another decision that we look at is, am I deciding between speed versus quality? This is something that as product designers and people that work in software are always thinking about, you know, speed versus quality. And something that helps me out here is something called problem solution confidence. So at the beginning of a project, you know, if you have low confidence in the problem that you're solving for, then it becomes a lot more important to, to optimize for speed and a lot of iterations. If you have high confidence in the problem, but maybe low confidence in the solution you're designing, then you have to kind of split a difference. And then finally, if you have high confidence in the problem and the solution, then quality becomes even more important then. You want to make sure that you're solving for all your different edge cases and all your different user groups. So those are a couple models that help you understand how to make decisions. Lastly, we'll look at a few to help you communicate ideas. So if I'm asking myself, am I giving quick feedback? Uh, a model that helps here a little bit is called what, so what, now what. So first you tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you say why it's important. And then finally, you end by ta uh, talking about next steps. So just to put this uh, into like an example, uh, if you're talking with, like say, a PM at the beginning of a project, it might sound like this. You could say, hey, you know, we need to get a line on the user problem. And this is really important because we want to make sure that we're investing 
in the right areas. So let's develop a research plan. How does tomorrow sound? And I find that this is just like a really good lightweight way to structure any sort of communication that you're having, whether it's short in-person feedback or even like an email. And then finally, if I'm asking myself, you know, am I preparing long-form content? Something like a presentation or a doc or uh, a product review. Something that's really good to try is called the diamond model. And what you do is you basically take whatever idea that you want to talk about and put it into the shape of a diamond. And so you start with some sort of attention getter, like a story or a big stat. Then you quickly introduce your main topic. You do quick previews of your, your main points. And then you'll go into depth and to all of your main points. Finally, you do some summaries, do a conclusion, you know, and then do like a call to action at the very end. And I find this is just a, a really good way to start you know, when you have a blank page at the beginning of your, uh, of your doc. So those are the seven mental models that have been super, super useful to me. Um, they have helped me out a lot, and I hope they help you all out uh, a lot too. So in closing, Mental models are really just simple explanations of how something in the world works. Simple explanations of how something in the world works. They're really important because they help you simplify complexity, and they are very reusable. You can use them in a lot of different domains. Also, you'll want to make sure to have several models. It's no good just to have one or two. You'll want to have several that you're using throughout your day. If you want a few more resources and want to look things up, uh, there's several blogs, several books that are being uh, written on this subject, especially in the last few years. Uh, I'd highly recommend checking out one or all of those. And what I would love for all of you to do is next week, when you get back to your job, get back to your office, try one of these models next week. Uh, you'll be sitting at your desk, you know, making a decision, solving a problem, communicating an idea. Uh, think of one of these models. And then, once you've uh, actually tried one of these outs, I'd love for you to actually just create your own cheat sheet. Like I said at the beginning, all of you have different mental models that you are already using. Just go ahead and name them and create a, a trigger question for each one of them. If you want a sample of the, the one that I showed earlier, uh, that's the, the URL, it's mm-4-pd. And like I said, you know, when, when you're faced with uh, a lot of different domains and you're working outside of, of your comfort zone, I would encourage all of you all to just try out a mental model. And I promise you, if you do soon, you'll end up feeling like this. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>